and welcome back again. Uh, let's let's dwell a little bit on what we did, uh, talked about with uh, uh, Don Sutton was in Iraq. Vietnam was really the beginning of the television wars, as opposed to Korea and World War II. When you were there, and you were there, both of you there, it was the beginning of that era where you could see the big, well, they were using still film and then they went over to the tape. What, what were the reactions of your family? Were they watching this intensely every day, or did they, I ask you this and I ask you this, either one. What, well, it was difficult not to watch it, yeah. sort of like today's war. Mm -hmm. It's difficult not to see it because it's on every new newscast. Mm -hmm. uh, at the time, uh, this country was embroiled in a lot of social upheaval with the civil rights movement, the women's movement, and Vietnam all at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so there was a lot of upset and tension. The anti-war movement had, had started. Uh, tail end Charlie mm -hmm. for the company. Uh, so my gun tube orientations to the rear, mm -hmm. making sure that uh, nobody's coming up from behind. Um, Were any of your troops um, combat experience before this? No. No. How about the officers? Uh, no. No. Um, our uh, platoon commander, uh, he was with 3rd LAR for uh, a while, and mm -hmm. that's really about all I know. So they'd, they'd never seen Desert Storm or any no. of this? No. So they came in pretty cold, just like everybody else did. Mm -hmm. What? When I, I ask that, because there's an expectation of what you're going to see, or maybe you think you're going to see, right. and then here's the reality. Well, you know, when um, when we started to catch up with the, uh, the RCT, uh, that's when you started seeing the dead bodies on the side of the road. And uh, we had stopped at one location, and uh, I think there was like three dead Iraqis uh, on the side of the road where I had our, my sergeants actually take uh, the junior Marines and, and show them the reality of what, what's going on here mm -hmm. and to make sure that their head's screwed on straight to mm -hmm. where they don't end up like those guys. Because mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of them, they're, they're young kids, 18, 19 years old. Mm -hmm. They've never seen a dead person before in their life. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I made a point of having the sergeants go out and show them this um, just to kind of get their head in the game. And how to how did they about. react? Um, you know, they, they did pretty good. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they, they did their jobs well. And, uh, uh, and I think that it probably drove home a point, hey, you know, mm -hmm. this is for real. You know, people are going to die. Uh, better him than me mm -hmm. type thing, mm -hmm. uh, you know, do our job, let's get the heck out of here and, uh, you know, go home to our family. So and I'm real proud of all my guys. They did, they did real well. Did you see a lot of casualties there? No, as I said, uh, I was, I was, we were really uh, some of the lucky ones that mm -hmm. uh, where we were, there just wasn't, that wasn't happening during the time that I was there, mm -hmm. that there were so many casualties, so, uh, and most of them, again, were Iraqis, so. So you didn't really see a lot of your own guys going down. No, not, not in Iraq. I saw it in Desert Storm, but not, not like, not in Iraq. Why more in Desert Storm? Because it was supposedly a better plant, or is it just because it's a bigger operation? It was, I guess it was just a bigger operation, or where I was mm -hmm. then compared to where I was this time. Uh, you know, and that that was the thing that that uh, that hit home with me was that if I have to go somewhere else again, mm -hmm. that it won't be the same. Yeah, and I won't be able to plan for it. And I, I yeah. you make it up as you go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When when you first saw the I mean, the expanse of this country, we've had people on here uh, prior about being there. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that they impressed, and they all said the same thing: it's expansive. There's just miles and miles of miles and miles. Mm -hmm. When you look at it from a tactical point of view, don't you have an advantage of looking out there? You can see somebody coming at you. Well, you know, uh, in the southern area, it was, it was pretty open, um, although we were still limited to the roads. Mm -hmm. um, and when we were training in Kuwait, we thought it was going to be, we're, you know, we're training for maneuver warfare, right. open desert, you know, mm -hmm. wedges and Vs and mm -hmm. all this other mm -hmm. stuff. And uh, we crossed over, and we're, all, we're tethered to the road. Um, mm -hmm. And once we got up uh, into the central area, you didn't leave the road or else you're getting stuck because they had flooded out the fields. and. Uh, so it was basically, you know, column movements, mm -hmm. um, you know, convoy type uh, patrols. Um, so it really wasn't, you know, opened up. 
So you didn't do any search and destroy thing? Oh, well, we did that. Oh. We did plenty of that, but we were doing it in an urban environment. Oh, um, no. And so now it's, you know, it's uh, three-dimensional. Mm -hmm. uh, now you've got to constantly be aware of, uh, you know, what's above you, mm -hmm. what you're going under, mm -hmm. uh, especially if you got your gun tube, uh, the turrets mm -hmm. traverse somewhere, so you're constantly having to bring your gunner back, you know, in front, mm -hmm. so he doesn't hit telephone poles and mm -hmm. and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, but you constantly got to look at the roofs because mm -hmm. I was just waiting for somebody to drop, you know, Molotov cocktails on us mm -hmm. or fire RPGs or. Okay, our director here, Dante, uh, was in Nam and he was making references in the between here about how the difference is when he was hit there. I mean, they came in and medevaced him. There's a difference in this case. You explain that, how you treat people differently from that situation, because it wasn't even a corpsman there. Well, if there's not a medical personnel, um, we were just speaking about the, uh, with the Marines, mm -hmm. we, we do something a little bit different now. So we have a combat mm -hmm. lifesavers course. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a spinoff from the, what the Army put together. And uh, we teach the Marines mm -hmm. how, to, how to render aid and a mm -hmm. lot of the things that we're going to experience or things that they might come mm -hmm. across mm -hmm. in, on, in and on the battlefield mm -hmm. itself where if, if a medical personnel was down himself mm -hmm. or, okay. I mean, and these things happen. So we, we give them the necessary tools. We tell them uh, how, how it's going to happen, how it might happen, mm -hmm. and it's a, it's a full course that, mm -hmm. we've, that we've started teaching to help them help each other. And right. Do you get yeah. caught in a situation like that? Um, not, not really, um, but even back when we were in Kuwait preparing to uh, cross the line of departure, um, you know, we get a lot of classes, like I said earlier, but it's, uh, you know, self-aid, buddy aid, corpsman aid, mm -hmm. you know, and like what the docs have, uh, you know, taught us, you know, how to uh, give IVs, apply tourniquets, you know, start the breathing, stop the bleeding, mm -hmm. protect the wound, treat for shock. Mm -hmm. You know all those type of things, and, and each marine in the in the platoon knows what to do uh, once you know they they get engaged. Mm -hmm. um, and we also kind of tell them, hey, you know, you might see, you know, your partner, your your combat mm -hmm. buddy, you know, bleeding somewhere, but it might be uh, quicker to get him help is to neutralize the threat. Mm -hmm. right. And you know, kill the enemy, and then come back, back, and then. And that's part of that class that's so helpful. Is you don't, you're mm -hmm. not having guys just. You're you're making them think that it might be more beneficial to, to mm -hmm. uh, kibosh the enemy before we run out into the street and try and save our buddy. Right. Yeah. Now, did you really see the guys up right here in your face? The enemy right up here in your no. face? No, no, they're real uh, cowards. Uh, other than there was one uh, uh, suicide bomber. Mm -hmm. Uh, dropped a grenade in the trunk of a car uh, at, at one of our checkpoints. Mm -hmm. We saw him coming, mm -hmm. and uh, but you know he's dressed in plain clothes, mm -hmm. um, and uh, my gunner actually saw him mm -hmm. from about 300 meters away and just mm -hmm. advised me, hey, this guy's coming down. He's got his hands behind his back. Uh, you know, I radio up to my scout team leader, hey, keep your eye out for this guy. And mm -hmm. right at that time, he just ducked right behind the car, uh, and it was a setup. And they had uh, threw the grenade in the car. Car blows up. Uh, none of the scouts got fragged. Um, immediately shot and killed that guy. And uh, then his three buddies run across uh, and took cover behind a uh, kind of like a little rock building, mm -hmm. uh, mud hut, if you will. And then we, we pretty much uh, uh, let them have it. Any regrets for going over? No, none whatsoever. Yeah. No, no, not a one. Okay. We're down to the last minute. Given the circumstances, and you know the circumstances here and there, we're going to be there two more years, it looks like. Is this really worth it? Yeah. Okay. I, I, you know, I, I don't, I couldn't tell you how everybody else feels, but when you're over there, it's, uh, mm. it's, it, it doesn't even, it doesn't matter why you're there. Uh, once you get there, I mean, you, you do it out of, out of your duty. You do it out of what, this is what you said you would do. But once you get there, it's about, um, getting the job done and the guy next to you. And right. That's what it becomes. Oh, definitely. Uh, as, as there is another series of blips that is coming this way. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm sorry, here they are up here is the edge of it. Mm -hmm. and, and this is supposedly, this series of blips that st starts off here is the P3. Now eventually what's going to happen is all of these in the same 
uh, looks in the same vertical space. Mm -hmm. If you will, imagine uh, a uh, shopping mall parking mm -hmm. lot, okay, and one maybe where there's even a two or three mm -hmm. elevation parking garage here. What you have on the screen is, is the, the radar scope uh, is someone saying, okay, I know that U.S. Air is flying at 24,000 feet. I know that TWA 800 is flying at 13,700 feet because of numbers on here. Mm -hmm. uh, on, on another one over here, we part because it's, it's true, is that a hole breaches an airplane right. and everything starts sucking out, you right. know, and it's because of uh, disequal pressure, but also mm -hmm. The plane by this time is going about 400 miles an hour, yeah. and and so that wind, that wind force I think itself. The VA may have a few things she needs to say to Ruth. Ruth, Ruth, they're going to bring the inmates in, and after the deputy gives us some instruction, and after you've had a chance to look, we're going to ask you some questions. Well, I just said I've done this before, and I'm a little bit apprehensive. You okay? Just take a deep breath for me. He's not going to be able to see you. Are you sure? He's not going to be able to see you at all. Well, I can see it so plainly. I, I know. I know, but the way this glass is designed, they're not going to be able to see you, so you're safe here, okay? Deputy Perry's right here, so nothing's going to happen to you. All right? We're all right here. Oh. Step 
There's some things going on right now that I'm sure you have a very strong opinion upon. Um, are you going to be doing anything publicly regarding these issues? Are you talking about the war in Iraq, North Korea? What are you talking about? <laughs> Poverty, <laughs> what? Ch you know, child abuse, uh, domestic abuse? Which are you talking about? Letting my little light shine. Any fa films you're excited about seeing? I have no idea who I'm going to see and what films are honored. I have no idea. The only thing I know is that I'm giving Stephen Daldry the International Filmmakers Award, and I'm very honored to do that, and everything else is going to be a surprise. My, well, the we first to, major star I ever talked to was Gregory Peck, oh, and that was back in the 70s, and he was great. And just became fast friends. And I'm just finding this out myself about you two, so that, that's really, that's, that's great. I, I, you, you know, I owe it all to the main titles for Red Dragon, because I was scoring them the day after we met. And I begged Bridget, come on down and just hear their orchestra going. And she showed up, and uh, and I think it really had nothing to do with me. It was the sound of the violins. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, and the trombones were particularly sweet that day, and I think that impressed her. It's true. Well, whatever it is, I'm glad you guys are together, and enjoy the rest of the festivities. Thank you for talking with us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, Danny Elfman didn't quite care for huh? the question. Yeah, care what you about, about Tales from the Crypt and The Simpsons, but you know what? We're going to play, I'm going to see to it, it that we get samples of both theme songs. They're exactly the same theme song. <laughs> the Simpsons is kind of light and on a higher higher key, and the Tales from the Crypt is a little bit lower. And anyway, none, regardless, you know what? The guys put made some to do a few things that sound alike. Hey, he's heard. This is the story of Eva Krauts, survivor of Auschwitz concentration camp. Hello, Eva. Thank Hi. you for being here with me today. Nice being with you. I know that you are living a very thriving, beautiful, fantastic life, but I also know it hasn't always been that way. You've been through some very incredible experiences, and today, thank you for being willing to share your story with us. My name is Trina Johnson. Have you ever been through anything and survived it? Well, today you have an opportunity to meet someone who has been through an incredible experience and you want to start by telling us how old you were and where you were and what happened to you. Well, I was born in Poland and when the war broke out and the Germans occupied Poland, I was a 14-year-old girl 
the people who went to Dr. Mengele, the one who went to the right, the others to the left, went to the ovens. You're in a line and in line, just like, this. like that. And and some pointed out through the chimney that there is the smoke coming out. And those are the ovens. And this we knew already in Auschwitz when I was. And you, you knew know. what was happening. Yes. In Auschwitz we knew. How did you deal with that kind of terror and fear? Every single day to me was like this is the last day. Many people will ask me questions and they will say, you had to have hope. I really didn't. Mm -hmm. If I talk about myself, if I had hope, I didn't. Even though I remember, and that was in Hindenburg in that camp, and when we heard the planes going by, and we thought that those are the Americans, and we ran out and we applauded, and we were so happy because we thought that they will bomb the camp. I still somehow, I was so young, and there were some older people, and they used to say that we will be liberated, that there will be a time. But I somehow did not believe. I always felt that this is the last day. And, and you had to be, yes, I was asked questions before if in what I believed. And you read my letter. Mm -hmm. I some believe that it believed in luck. Mm -hmm. Because how many times I was so close to death. Mm -hmm. And it isn't because I was stronger. The strong survived. The weak did not. I remember when I was staying in front of Mengele, I was a little girl, and there were beautiful young girls, healthy. They went to the ovens, and I went to Hindenburg, to this labor camp. So I don't know what is it. I think it's luck. What else? Do you recall anything, any certain thing or a person? What is it that kept you alive, do you think? What kept me alive is, yes, luck. And then I was, many of us among us gave up. And they sat in that place, in Bergen-Belsen. Yeah, and they did not move. They did not leave that barrack. And this is how they died. I used to get out from that barrack and go and be like a beggar. Stay on the, the kitchen. And I have a other story which I missed about the German. And beg for a little food and did some work in the camp, like carrying the food to the barracks. And I got this little bit of extra little food. And I remember running, running to the barracks and sharing with my friend. It's very easy to share when you have a lot. But please, God, be my witness. I shared when I had little, I shared with others. I'm still sharing. I still believe in sharing, in giving of yourself and helping others to make a better world. You are. But in 1945, and I'm sure that that story never was told, because there was this German doctor that we befriended after the war. 
And the day of liberation, he went into the kitchen because the Germans were escaping already from the camp. Mm. The Hungarians took over. They gave him the rifles they throw, and the Hungarians took over, and the Germans escaped. But what they did, they went into the kitchen, and they poisoned the food. Mm. This German doctor went into that kitchen and told him not to give us out the food. That story was never told by anybody. And the name of this doctor was Dr. Kurske. And he saved a lot of lives. Later, after liberation, he became the head doctor in our camp. And we became very close friends with us, with all, all of the survivors. And I hope that he is among the righteous in Israel because I've been there and I was looking for his name. At the time when I was there, I didn't see it. Mm -hmm. But this German doctor saved a lot of lives. Mm -hmm. And he lived with us in the camp and he was my doctor after the war. And um, I'm really happy for sharing an incredible experience of your life. Uh, to bring it a little more up to date now, I know the button that you have on that you wear so proudly is uh, your husband, your late husband. Yes. And uh, we wanted to get a shot of that. And um, I'm real interested in that love story there. <laughs> when your eyes met at the camp and was instant love. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Yes. And so there's a certain bond, obviously, yes. that you have and still yes. carries with you today with yes. other survivors. We built a life together. We came out from a camp, like I mentioned before. We both had nothing, but we were very happy to be alike. And we have a beautiful family. Mm -hmm. But, like I mentioned to you, my husband passed away. It's almost, it's 10 years, yes. But I met a man in Palm Springs seven years ago who is also a survivor. And we are together. Right at the moment, he's very sick. But we had a beautiful relationship. And because we went through so much pain, he lost his wife. I lost my husband. We understand one another. Right. And we feel for one another. We have a history together, and that's why our relationship is so strong. Mm -hmm. And I pray to God, please God, let him get well. So, I've been through before, I'm going through now, and I hope I will survive this too. And please God, let him get well. Mm -hmm. He too has a lovely family, and he too built his life in the United States when he came to this country very young and did everything on his own. And all I can pray is wish for him to get well. Eva, are there other survivors that you stay in contact with? Yes. Were I, they from your camp? From, yes some from my camp, mm. some are not from my camp, but we feel it's a kinship, it's something that it draw us together one to another. We have so much in common. Mm -hmm. We often talk about our lives and what we all went through and then how happy we are here now 
being in the United States. And God gave us our life back. Thank you, God. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I'm thankful, too. <laughs> I know very recently Steven Spielberg, three to four years ago, um, came to your home. Yes. And did a documentary. Yes. Uh, what was that like? Well, ev every time I speak of my experiences, it's very painful for me. It's reawakening my horrible, horrible memories. Like I mentioned before to you, that we must remember the dead and educate right. the living right. because I wished and I hope that the world should never never forget because I will always remember mm -hmm. so it is a hardship when I speak of all the experiences the horrible experiences that I endured in my life. But I think I became a better person. I appreciate everything that I have. I'm not talking right now about material things. I appreciate life. How would you describe yourself? A very happy person, very energetic. I always like to do and go places and experience different people uh, and be with people. I love people. Mm -hmm. I love people. I will show you later a gift from my children but they gave it to me. And you will hear what they think of me. <laughs> okay. I'm always happy. I'm always yeah. appreciating life. And life is beautiful mm -hmm. every single day. We should be thankful yeah. for every day. Is that, because, your, is that your motto? Yes, because <laughs> you never know what tomorrow will bring. Right. Today is your day, so hold on and do the most with it. That's all we know for sure that we have. Yes, <laughs> today is yours. Mm -hmm. It seems like to me, the same way in the camp, how you forced yourself to get up. To get up day and go out, yes. Is why you lived, and now all, also, you're forcing yourself to speak of the horrific things that you went through so others can learn and not forget. Because we can learn an awful lot from your story. I know I have today. Thank you. I really have. Thank you. Thank you for being kind. Oh. <laughs> if you could change anything at all from your past, would you? And what would you change? Well, I don't understand that question. Because if I could change, I would <laughs> love to have my husband. Mm. <laughs> if I could change, I would like to have my parents, my family.